Okay. All right, the class is being recorded. Uh, just a second, please. There we go. It's good to see everybody. Any prayer requests? I see we, uh, I just got the email yesterday from uh, Pastor Victor and uh, about some uh, prayer requests for the seminary. So I have made note of that. Uh, we will pray about the, uh, that. Does anybody else have some new prayer requests or testimonies? Okay, well, you may always email, of course, and, and that is that will be good. And I am praying for each of you individually. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for these students. Thank you for your sheep in India. Please bless these, uh, bless these uh, men and ladies and, and help especially those uh, men that are pastors that will be your shepherds in India. Guide them and bless them and protect them and their flock and their families. Protect them. We pray that also the youth, you would, you would help the youth in the churches that they would not be distracted by the world, but that they would uh, but that they would be open to the Holy Spirit and his work. We pray especially for Pastor uh, Rajan Thapa and his ministry in Delhi. We pray for Pastor Sewak Ram and his ministry as well. We pray for the seminary. Thank you for, for the seminary and all the students there. Thank you for the, the, uh, just your provision for them. We pray that you would provide beds for the students. We pray that you would, uh, that you would give them tables that they need. Thank you for that provision. We thank you for the, we pray that you would provide the furniture and the dormitory. And thank you for your provision of a new car. Please protect that car. May it not get stolen. May you, may you assign an angel to protect the car, uh, Lord. And we pray for, and we know that you can protect the car. We pray for the national teaching staff, Lord, that you would support them. And please provide uh, bookshelves for the library as well for the seminary. And in Jesus name, amen. Okay, let us get started then. Uh, we will, in a few minutes, we will look at my favorite passage in 1 Peter. Uh, we will review, but first I would like to start with the share screen. Okay, oops. The, uh, uh, Brother Victor, is it possible for me to share the screen? Yes, oh yes, sir. Okay, I had, it, it said host had disabled the share screen option. So let me try again. Aha, now we, there we go. Thank you. Okay. I'm not sure why that is there. Okay, so a couple of things real quick. Just a reminder that when possible, I need everybody to sign up. There we are. Just a reminder, I need everybody to sign up on Logos. I'll go over that in a minute. Uh, just a reminder, I send you the articles for you to read ahead of time. Uh, if, if necessary, you can copy material from the articles and this from my lectures as well. And you can go to Google uh, Translate. And I do this with German sources because I'm supposed to be able to read German, but not as well as I should. <laughs> my, uh, when I was doing my PhD, I had to take two semesters of German and my teacher was a native speaker of German. He was a well-known scholar from Austria and he was not the easiest teacher. So, <laughs> but for example, you can cut and paste and then Google translate will translate. And this is French. And sometimes it does a good job, sometimes it does not do a good job, but just keep that in mind. Uh, I would really like everybody oops, to please sign up. I know there are internet issues. I know sometimes uh, some people have better connections than others, but please, if at all possible, sign up for Faith Life and Logos. I will show you. I remember my password. There we go. I have sent out invitations. This is the this is the uh, what it looks like. The Faith Life groups. I have so far only seven, uh, six people besides myself, six members and one follower. I have assigned. I have assigned all those people. 
There we are. I have assigned all those people access to the commentary on First Peter, uh, but this is not yet even half of everybody in the class. So uh, those, whether whether you be here live right now or if you're watching the recording, please sign up. I sent out an invitation. Uh, let me see if I can find where the invitation is. Uh, let's see. It may be that uh, let's see somewhere it lists all the invitations I've sent, but I, I've sent everybody uh, in this class an invitation. It may be that for some of you, the invitation went into your spam folder, uh, which most email systems, especially Gmail, have a spam folder. So please just check that sometime. Uh, and once you sign up, I can assign you the first Peter the first Peter passage. Um, even if you are having trouble downloading, you should still be able to, let's see, you should still be able to read first Peter Uh, okay, you should still be able to read your first Peter commentary uh, simply simply offline. I don't remember how. I'll, I will look into that. I will try and send a screenshot for you. Uh, but there are various uh, resources that can help you. And I'm trying to help. I am not an expert in Logos, but uh, if there's anybody that has been able to access the first Peter commentary, please help the others. Uh, in in uh, in perhaps in a language other than English, if necessary, please help the others to to understand how to best access it. But the important thing is, I need people to go into Logos tomorrow. I will try and I will try and send I will try and send the chapter two of Wayne Grudem's commentary, so that those of you that are struggling to access Logos can still at least read chapter two. But I am asking you to please try and. Uh, try and learn how to how how to access the commentary on Logos if at all possible. And once again, I'm willing to try and help. I, I can send screenshots and so forth. Uh, secondly, let's look at the study guide. The midterm exam is coming up soon. Actually, let's look at the syllabus for this class. There we go. So your midterm exam is coming up soon. Remember, uh, this is a doctorate of ministry class. It is a higher, more advanced class. So I expect uh, some more out of you than, than I would at a simply a master's class. The midterm is coming up on, let's see, day five. Today is day five. It is August 2nd. Uh, not until August 7th, 16th. So you have uh, after next week's class, I will send everybody the midterm examination, and then you are to take that on your own time. Uh, please, the only resource you are allowed when you take the exam is Bibles. Any Bibles, as many Bibles as you wish, in as many languages as you wish, that is allowed. However, that is the only source that is allowed. But before that, you may study for the, you may study for the exam by looking at my notes. You may look at uh, various articles. You may talk to each other and help each other study for the exam, but once you take the exam, please simply take it on your own and then email me the results. Uh, remember also, only one person has turned in the study sheet that I sent some time ago. Only one person has turned in that, and that eventually all the study sheets together will make up uh, 12% of your grade. So that is quite a bit of the grade. If you wish to get an A in this class, you need to have finished all the study sheets. And only one person turned in the first one. Uh, you may, if necessary, you may simply email me the answers. You may put them in an email, and that is acceptable uh, if you are having difficulty with, uh, with other options. Okay, uh, let's see. Before we get back into First Peter, are there any questions or, or issues with with any with the syllabus or with logos or anything. Once again, uh, those of you that have been able to successfully sign up and those of you that have been able to access the first Peter commentary on logos software, 
Uh, please help the others. Uh, if you are able to, uh, perhaps in a language other than English, if necessary, if that would help. I know this is very technical. I'm trying to help uh, by, by copying off the chapters and sending them to you via PDF. I'm trying to help those who, are, who have struggled, who have not yet been able to access it on Logos. Uh, but please try to access on Logos as much as possible. Okay, oh, one more thing. Let's look at, let's look at the study guide. So at this point on the study guide, so this is material that may be on the examination. Uh, everything here, uh, oh, up to here, we will talk about this today. We will talk about number nine today. We will talk about number 10 today. But questions one through eight, you should know. And search the lecture notes if you're not sure. So questions one through eight, you should know. Nine and 10, we will study today. Number 11, number 12, number 13, you should know. Uh, to clarify, foreknowledge refers to God's ability to know the future. It does not refer to predestination, which is what the Calvinists wish to say. It rather refers to his ability to know the future. The four main commands, remember we talked about that last week. Uh, 1 Peter 1.18, that should be in the notes. Uh, alludes to means refers to. From what book and chapter in the Old Testament does Peter draw from his discussion of the new birth? We talked about that last week. Uh, what are the two most likely understandings of the sin? Whoop, <laughs> that is a mistake in English. It says the sense milk of the word. That should be the sincere, S-I-N-C-E-R-E. -E. I apologize, that is my mistake. And then we will study this one today, I believe. So that is what you should know on the study guide. And then essay questions, number one. Uh, not yet, number two, we are still studying number two. Probably these will be more for the final exam. These will be more for the final exam than the midterm. I think probably number one from the midterm, number question number one of the essay questions, you will need to write on question number one for the midterm. So please study that. Remember, you are allowed to use your Bible. You may have your Bible, any language, whether Greek or Hebrew or, or Hindi or, or English or any language. Uh, you may have it open while you do the exam. That is the only resource you may have is the, Bi <coughs> is the Bibles. So this should not be a difficult question, but be prepared for that question. Uh, and I think the rest will probably be more likely on the final exam. Okay, let's begin then with our study. Let's see, sir, let's see how far we've gotten. Sir, excuse me, sir. You have been yes. asking, uh, sir, uh, that this note uh, uh, we have received it today. Uh, uh, that note uh, have uh, this uh, references are given here. Uh, references are given here. This is uh, okay. it's uh, in the footnote. Okay. So, Mac Knight, 1 Peter 1, 24. Uh, it is a little, I just want to know it's, uh, where it is actually. It should be in that. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I see what you're saying. So, McKnight, 1 Peter uh, 1, 24. Those are, so those, you don't necessarily need to read those. Those are my, my citations of other books that I have read. So, if I, if I take a quote... If I take a quote from elsewhere, if, if the quote is not mine, if I got it from another book, then I will put it in a footnote. And uh, but the full information um, I've been I should be putting in the full information, but I've been busy. <laughs> but yes, the uh, so I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. So uh, we can take it from uh, uh, we, uh, if we click that. Can we get that <clears throat> the full information in there? Is there provision? Should I see? I will. I will try and uh, I will try and give you the full information. Clicking clicking on it won't do any good. Probably. Um, I will try tomorrow. I will create a document that will list ev the full information of, of every book I've read so far. Of uh, used used so far, not read, but used so far. Uh, to yeah. Tomorrow, I will try and get you that information. Uh, can can we get, if you can give us a link? No, we can just click and then we can study. Instead of uh, you have to do a lot of jobs otherwise. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um. 
for Is some it? of those for some of those there won't be a link okay. uh some of them can be accessed on google books right um it is it is not necessary for you to be able to have access to those if if you are able to gain access that is fine but it is not necessary you don't need to read it in other words it will be too much right right uh remember for the bible studies i think you only need three sources i think for each maybe two i i don't remember what i had said uh yes let's see <clears throat> two for the Bible studies, two. So for the Bible studies, you only need two sources. So whatever you can access, and one of those sources may be your textbook, Wayne Grudem, which you should have access to. Um, so in other words, you don't need, in, in my notes, you do not need access to those sources that I cite in a footnote, but I will try and provide you more information. Uh, you may, and then you may look for them on Google Notes. I, I will write a note right now. I will write myself a note tomorrow. Tomorrow I will create a document, and if I if I can find them on Google on Google uh, doc on Google Books, I will give you the link to them on Google Books as well. So, so you are coming tomorrow again? I will. I will create a document tomorrow for okay. you and send it to you. All right. Right. I, I don't think I'm teaching tomorrow, but <laughs> I will. I will send you a document sometime tomorrow uh, by my time. Uh, let's see, Google Books, and that will help. But uh, for 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 you as as students, it is important also that you learn to search Google Books and other resources uh, by yourself to find those links. And I uh, the first day of class we looked at how to do that with Google Books. Some so it's good to experiment with Google Books and type in First Peter and see which books come up. Uh, so, for example, let me just show you. So if I go, I bring up Google Chrome. And of course, this will partially depend on how well your Internet connection is. I, I understand that it's it's not uh, it's not easy sometimes. So Google Books. So if I go to Google Books and if I type in. First Peter Scott McKnight. Then that is not it. <laughs> yeah. uh, it is giving me everything. Ah, here it is. Here it is. This is the book. So this is the book that I, I put in footnote one that I quote from and put in footnote one. And notice right here, it says preview. Everybody see that? It yes. says preview. That means at least part of the book you are able to access. So I click on here and it will let me read part of the book. General editor, I can ignore the first few pages. <laughs> there we are, there we are. It gives me the introduction. It gives me quite a bit. Ah, pages 25 through 26 are not shown, but I can read a lot from this book. Surprisingly so, it's an older book, but I can read a lot from this book uh, just on Google Books. So that is one way, but I will try and uh, try and send you the links, the links tomorrow. But does that make sense? Do you see how you can access it from Google Books just by typing in the name? Right, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, Google Books can be a very, very helpful tool. I've, I've used it quite often. So. Okay, good. Any other questions? Oh, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, so regarding the grading here, number one is reading eight percent and second six days sits uh, a study sit over Simon reading. So yes. all these things do we need to present a uh, reading report to you, sir? Uh, at the very or end just, of the uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, we need to write a report, right? what we have read yes but at the at the very end of class and when when the class is done the final deadline which is uh just a second the final deadline when i need to see the reading report is uh monday october 3rd monday october 3rd uh your time which i think would be 
probably Sunday evening for me, but your, your time, Monday, October 3rd, please send in uh, the reading report. Uh, if you're able to use the document, I send it in fine, but if necessary, you can use the information. Somebody is causing static. Is that me? Okay, there we go, there we go. Uh, so, so Monday, October 3rd, uh, if necessary, you may simply send me an email with all the data, what you have read and so forth and whether it was late or not. But yes, that is Monday, October 3rd. Uh, tell me what you have read. And I will calculate your grade from there. Sir, I just also want to clear uh, the Ming thing he, he was asking the same. Uh, Ming thing, no, Andrew asked. So the, the exam should be uh, uh, how we have to conduct the exam. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 whatever we studied, we supposed to write and send to you later. Yes. Email. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Along with the, all the assignments. Yes. And uh, right, uh, a little bit at a time. So there is one assignment that is already due and only one person has turned it in. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so they are right now, they right now have a good grade. Everybody else, well, they need to turn the assignment in. It was the study sheet that I sent out a couple weeks ago. And uh, that needs to be filled out. If necessary, simply put it in an email. I'm okay with that if necessary. Uh, but yes, the study sheet needs to be filled out. The exams, uh, you can, there are a couple ways you can do the exam. Uh, obviously, when you're doing the exam, you should not be with any other students or at least not talking with them. Uh, you may write it down on paper and take pictures of the paper and send it to me, or you may, uh, you may use a Word document. That would be the preferable option, use the Word document, or you may, if necessary, put it in an email, put all the questions, uh, answers to the questions in an email and send it to me an email. That would be for those of you that are having difficulty accessing a word uh, a uh, word processor uh, though there are a couple options for that that I showed you earlier so any any way you can get your answers to me is fine and I will do my best to, to grade them as as I receive them uh, but yes yeah, so th does does that help yes yes okay good so we need your will... email I'm sorry we need your email address, sir. Your email, email address. Yes. So we yes. Don't I will have, email you the exam. So we don't have your email address. Okay? Email oh. is in, I think, uh, there uh, in the link. It is. It is in the syllabus. Okay. Uh, all of you should be receiving emails from me. Have you not been receiving emails from me? I have emailed everybody here. You can just respond. If you have not received emails from me, that's a problem <laughs> because I have, I have a distribution list from paul.himes at, at baptistcollege.org. I have a distribution list with everybody's email address on it. And if, if you have not been receiving an email from me at all, for example, yesterday I sent out an email to everybody. If you have not been receiving an email from me, please talk to Dr. Victor uh, soon, because that needs to be fixed, because it is absolutely important, essential that you are receiving emails from me. Uh, if you receive an email from me, then you have my email address. You can simply respond to that email. But yes, if, if you have not been getting emails from me, then that is a big, 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 big problem. <laughs> so please talk to uh, uh, Dr. Victor immediately about that, and he can give you my email address. It is also on the syllabus. Uh, if you look at the syllabus, Footnote one on the syllabus, it says Paul Hines is professor of Bible and ancient languages, et cetera, et cetera. And there I give you two email addresses. Either one is acceptable. Uh, please, it is actually preferable to use the first one, paul.himes at baptistcollege.org. Uh, if you use the second one, it might go to spam, though I will, I double check my spam folder once a week, but it is preferable to use the first one. So, but definitely, if you have not been receiving emails from me, please talk to Dr. Victor immediately, and he will and he will make sure everything is okay. So, yes, sir, I, I have received them. Okay, I, good. I, good. Yeah, I got, I got. I didn't good. Yeah, today. I got. Okay, 
then you may simply respond to the email that I that I've sent, and that is fine. And you may uh, you may put the content of the exam, the questions to the exam, in the email if you wish. The answers I can collect from the same email notes which you have given, sir. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? Yeah. For uh, excuse me. For the answers and all, I can just uh, take the notes from your notes, you know, answers from your notes. Go to yes. Uh, get the answers from the notes which are sent in the email. Yes, but you must memorize the answers, though. So it'll be a little bit of work. Uh, so in other words, you may study my notes. You may study the reading. And you will study the answers and you will learn the answers. But then when you take the exam, uh, you may you may simply, which may be the email, you may simply take the exam and send it as email. Uh, but then they must come from in here. <laughs> in other words, you may only look at the Bible when you take the exam. But yes, you may simply study my notes and memorize my notes. And, and the other reading as well. Mm -hmm. OK, good, good. Any other questions? Okay, it is time to study my favorite passage of scripture. Let's see, play from current slide. And here we go. We have focused on the four imperatives. We focused on the wordplay, we focused on the sincere milk of the word, which could refer either to God's word, or it could refer to Jesus Christ, or it could refer to both. Uh, notice there is a wordplay in the Greek, Christos, Christos, the Lord is gracious. This is also proving the deity of Jesus Christ, because Jesus is identified as the Lord in the Old Testament. Psalm 34, 8, O taste and see that Yahweh, notice the all capitals there, that is in English, uh, most translations in English, that means that is the divine name Yahweh or Jehovah. However, the J is pronounced like a Y in ancient Hebrew, so it is Yahweh. Uh, so that is key. Now, with that in mind, we can move on to verses 4 through 8. 1 Peter 4 through 8. And I have in my, uh, in my lecture notes my own translation that I read, but I'll just read from the uh, King James also which many of us are familiar with, 1 Peter 2, 5, 4 through 8, to whom coming, so this is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively or living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. And I'll go ahead and read verses 9 and 10. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that means a people for a possession, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. This passage, probably th this one series of six verses, uh, excuse me, five verses, verses six through 10, probably contains more Old Testament passages within five verses than any other place in scripture. And I want you to know which passage is being quoted in each part. Notice there, I, I have here up on the PowerPoint, uh, notice how many passages there are. But notice Isaiah is primary. The book of Isaiah is absolutely essential for Peter's theology. He draws heavily from Isaiah, both for his understanding of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, but also for his understanding of the church. However, also notice Psalm 118 or 117 is 
Septuagint, but Psalm 118 in English is important. Exodus is important. He draws from there. Hosea is important to Peter's theology as well. So the imagery introduced in 2.4, verse 4, is about the living stone. This is Jesus Christ. It is then used to talk about believers as well. Jesus Christ is the stone, but we are the stones that are built upon him. The Apostle Paul, uh, the Apostle Peter, not Paul, Peter utilizes an incredible amount of passages from the Old Testament to teach theology here. By the way, let me just challenge you, especially preachers of the gospel, if you wish to know the New Testament better, you must study the Old Testament. The New Testament would not exist without the Old Testament, and especially 1 Peter uh, is, is very, it is very, very essential that you understand the Old Testament. The God of the New Testament is the same God of the Old Testament, amen? And the Messiah of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ of the New Testament, and the promises of the Old Testament are still in effect for the New Testament as well. Now, the focus in this passage is on our relationship to Christ. We as a people and our relationship to Christ. Verse 4 speaks of Jesus Christ as the object of our faith, to whom coming. In other words, we come by faith. The world rejects him, but we have accepted him. Disallowed indeed of man, rejected by man, but chosen of God and precious. And this is a key point of contrast. The world rejected him by crucifying him, but God demonstrated that Jesus Christ is the true son of God, the true Messiah through his resurrection. Then verse uh, five focuses on how we as individual living stones become a church, a spiritual house. Now, I wonder if anybody here has any experience in building. Remember, Jesus was a craftsman. Uh, that would have involved carpentry, but also I believe Jesus helped build houses as well. The, the word in Greek describing Joseph's occupation uh, is, is a very broad term referring to simply being a craftsman. So I think Jesus would have been familiar with building houses alongside his earthly father, his adopted father, Joseph. Uh, perhaps some of you have experience with that as well in building houses or sheds. I am a horrible, horrible builder. <laughs> I have, uh, I will buy very cheap material and I will try and build a bookshelf. One of the prayer requests for your seminary is for shelf space. Of course, I once built a bookshelf from a very cheap store. And I was, it was when I was working on my PhD in North Carolina and I was sleeping on the floor on a mattress. I didn't have a full bed. And I had built the bookshelf right next to my bed, which was a mistake. And so I was sleeping and it was a fairly large bookshelf, perhaps five feet tall, which would be about a meter and a half tall. And I had loaded it up with books. And one day I returned home from, it was either work or classes. And I returned home and I saw that the bookshelf had collapsed on my bed full of books. And I was so grateful. The Lord protected me. I was not in bed sleeping at the time when it collapsed, but that was my fault because I am not a good builder. But the one true God, he is the greatest builder of all, and he is building a spiritual house. Jesus is the cornerstone, and we are the building blocks upon that house then. Now, notice the word elect here uh, in verse, oops, that comes later, uh, chosen of God. So that is the word elect. It is extremely important to understand it. It describes Jesus. So this is not a random occurrence. We will discuss the doctrine of election here. Election is not random where God simply chooses one person but not another, and it is random. And no, there is more to it than that. Election, the doctrine of election, to be properly understood, is tied closely to Jesus Christ. We are elect because we are united in faith with Jesus. And the error of the Calvinist is that they separate the doctrine of election too much from the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Well, the doctrine of election can only be understood when we understand our relationship with Jesus Christ. We will talk about that a little bit more. It is a key point. We also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Now, 
a very, very important doctrine. And I, I did not put this in my notes. I wish I had put it in my notes. So please, uh, for this part, at least listen carefully, because this is not in my notes. It should have been. A very, very, very important doctrine for us as Baptists, and really for most evangelical Christians, is the priesthood of the believer. The Roman Catholic Church errs, and indeed most religions, including Buddhism, and remember I, I grew up in Japan, so I am very familiar with Japanese Buddhism, most religions and the Roman Catholic Church make a horrible, horrible mistake by assuming that they're should be a particular class of people to which we must come to gain access to God. And that is a false doctrine, and that is a heresy of the Roman Catholic Church, that they believe that there is a specific class of people, the priests, that we must go to to confess, or that we must go to to be accepted by God. And that is a horrible, horrible heresy. Notice, who is a royal priesthood here? Does Peter say that only special Christians are a royal priesthood? May it never be. We are the royal priesthood. You and I and the people in your congregation that are truly born again, we are all together the royal priesthood. There is not one specific class of priests. No, we are all together the royal priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Notice by who? By Jesus Christ. The Roman Catholic Church expounds heresy by forcing people to go to the priest to be acceptable to God. But the Bible clearly teaches that we go to Jesus Christ to be acceptable to God. And that is a key point uh, that we must understand. Notice then, uh, Peter wishes us to picture a house, both a household and a physical building. I believe those, both of these are in play. Uh, a Chinese scholar, Wei Hsien Chan, in his book makes this point, a very good point. Uh, Peter wants us to be thinking of a physical house that one builds. So Jesus is the cornerstone and we are built on him. But also here in the language is the, it also here is the idea of a household. So picture yourself and all that live with you, a household united together. That is the other picture as well. So both are, are metaphors, spiritual pictures pictures of what the church is. This is all about the church. Now, let me point out something real quick here in the Greek, and, and this is from the article I, I sent you, my article on what is Peter doing in 1 Peter 2.6. Uh, Peter is correcting the Septuagint in 1 Peter 2.6. There are two points, even though Peter usually relies on the Greek Old Testament, a translation, there are two points because a translation is not inspired. Only the original words of the apostles and prophets in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic are inspired. Peter corrects the translation on a couple points uh, on the basis of the authority of the Hebrew. And uh, one of those places is 1 Peter 2, 6. And notice there that word tithemi. So tithemi begins and ends the sequence of verses, verses 6 through 8, set to be appointed. Behold, I, so verse six, behold, I lay in Zion. That word lay is tithemi. Behold, I set in Zion a chief cornerstone. But verse eight, even where, whereunto also they were appointed. That is the same word set, tithemi in the Greek. Peter is making a very, very, very important point there. That is a contrast between those who accept Jesus Christ and those who reject Jesus Christ. When we accept Jesus Christ, he is the set one. He is the appointed one. When we accept him, we gain honor in the eyes of God because we believe. Notice it is not works. It is faith. Tois pistu usen, to those who believe. That is us who believe. By believing in the chosen one, we gain honor. The disobedient one, however, gains dishonor. And when they reject Jesus Christ, they will be set or appointed to dishonor and disobedience. Now, it is because they reject Jesus Christ. This is a key point of difference uh, against the Calvinists. It is because they reject Jesus Christ that they are appointed to dishonor. In other words, Everybody who accepts Jesus Christ by faith is appointed to honor because is a 
neglected to honor because Jesus Christ also is the elect one. Everybody who rejects Jesus Christ will be elected to dishonor, to disobedience. And it all depends on what does one do with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the set one, the chosen one, the established one. Jesus Christ is the rock before we must, must bow. I love here the quotation by the German scholar. There are, there are not many. Many good German scholars, unfortunately, out of Germany came the most uh, extreme forms of liberal theology. However, once in a while, uh, there are German scholars that are worth reading. Martin Hengel would be one of them. Uh, but here, Leonard Goppel, I love what he has to say here. Please pay attention to this quotation. Christ is laid across the path of humanity on its course into the future. In the encounter with him, each person it is changed, one for salvation, one for destruction. One cannot simply step over Jesus to go on about the daily routine and pass him by to build a future. Whoever encounters him is inescapably changed through the encounter. Either one sees and becomes a living stone, or one stumbles as a blind person over Christ and comes to ruin, falling short of one's creator and redeemer and thereby of one's destiny. In other words, picture yourself walking through a mountain path out in perhaps the middle of nowhere, walking a mountain path. It is a narrow road and you come upon a stone that is barring your path, a, not a stone, a rock, a giant rock, perhaps almost bigger than you, and it is blocking your path. That is the picture that Peter is painting here of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ appears on the path of life in front of everybody, and they have a choice. One cannot remain neutral towards Jesus Christ. When they are, encounter Jesus Christ, they will be changed, either for honor or either for honor and election or for dishonor and destruction. There is no middle ground. Many of you have already seen this when you challenge people with the gospel. Now, this does not mean, of course, that, that people only get one opportunity to, to uh, accept Christ. Most people, I believe, get multiple opportunities. And yet, the fact is, what they do with Jesus Christ, whether they accept Jesus Christ or reject him, determines their destiny. My father spent th over 30 years in Japan, and he saw both People changed for better and people changed for worse. Uh, one, of our, uh, one, of, uh, one of his most notable converts in Japan was a man who belonged to the Japanese mafia, organized crime. And the Japanese mafia is called the Yakuza. It is interesting that traditionally in Japan, only two sorts of people have tattoos, the Yakuza, the mafia, the organized crime, and American sailors visiting Japan. <laughs> so usually if you saw a Japanese person with a tattoo on their arms, it meant he was an organized crime and they were very open about it. However, this man was gloriously saved and my father discipled him and helped him to be able to leave the Yakuza, the mafia, and to even be able to gain some police protection, I believe, and uh, helped him to move out of the town and move down south where he would be safer. And his life was gloriously changed from being a criminal to being a Christian that would glorify God through Jesus Christ. On the other hand, one time my father was going door to door talking to people about Jesus in Japan, and he ran across an old man. This would have been in the 80s, the 1980s. He ran across an old man who was a veteran of, Je of World War II. And Japan in World War II invaded China, invaded Korea, and they were very, very cruel. Japanese soldiers were very, very cruel uh, towards the people that they conquered. And, and dad asked this man, are you afraid of death? And the man said, no, I am not afraid to die. And he told the story of how he was, as a Japanese soldier, he was driving a tank in Manchuria, which was China, and he was fighting the, fighting the Russians in World War II, 100 years ago, 90 years ago, and his tank suddenly stopped, and Japanese tanks had very, very, very thin armor so that one shell exploding on a tank could kill uh, the person inside. And his tank stopped, and right in front of him, 
a artillery shell exploded. And if his tank had kept going, he would have died. And this man, this Japanese army veteran, war veteran said, ever since then, I have not been afraid of death. And then my father asked him, what about sin though? Aren't you afraid of the consequences of sin? And this Japanese army veteran said, I know that we Japanese did many bad things in World War II. And it, it is rare to find a Japanese person that will admit that, but he admitted that. I know that we Japanese did many bad things in World War II. But then he said a very heartbreaking phrase, but we do not repent, but I do not repent. And that broke my father's heart and he left and he wept after he had witnessed to this person. That person then encountered Jesus Christ and their life was changed, but not for the better. They hardened their heart then. So the point is, everybody has an encounter with Jesus Christ. He is the living stone. There can be no access to God apart from Jesus Christ, but there can be no neutrality. In other words, when one stands before God at the great white throne judgment, one cannot say to God, I am still investigating Jesus. I'm not really sure about him. There will be no excuse. One cannot be neutral about Jesus Christ. Either one accepts Jesus Christ as Savior and thus is appointed to honor and eternal life, or one rejects Jesus Christ and will be crushed by the stone. It is extremely important to remember that. Notice uh, earlier, the purpose of our being built upon Jesus Christ is to offer up spiritual sacrifices to the glory of God. Now, I mentioned we would talk a little bit about the doctrine of election here. I believe this is a key point that the doctrine of election is tied to Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the elect one. Now, did God elect Jesus Christ randomly? Well, no, obviously he did not. <laughs> Jesus Christ is the eternal son of God. There was a relationship there. That's why Jesus Christ was chosen. In other words, write this down, please. Election is on the basis of relationship. We are elect to eternal life because of our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That, and here I have, uh, I have a quote from M.L. Bruner that I wish to read that is a very important quote. Normally, I would not recommend M.L. Bruner for reading. <laughs> he is not that good a theologian. Um, he has some tendencies within his theology that I think are, can be harmful. However, in this one area, in just this one area, I believe M.L. Bruner is immensely valuable. Look at what he says. The absolute free grace of God purely generous love, that is Jesus Christ. It is applied to the world as a whole. It applies to all, but it applies to all insofar as they believe. Whoever excludes himself is excluded. He who does not allow himself to be included is not included. But he who allows himself to be included, he who believes is elect. And then this is the sentence I wish you to understand. To believe in Jesus Christ and to be of the elect is one and the same thing. One is elect because they believe in Jesus Christ and one and, and the two cannot be separated. Just as not to believe in Jesus Christ and not to be of the elect is the same thing. There is no other selection than this. There is no other number than that which is constituted by the fact of believing or not believing. In other words, why am I elect? Because I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, who is the elect one, who is the chosen one. That is the basis of it. And this then can offer great assurance. There are, it, it, is, it is funny because when, when we talk about assurance of salvation, both Calvinists and Arminians, so Calvinists would place uh, so much emphasis on the sovereignty of God that they forget about free will, but Arminians would would place so much emphasis on free will that they forget about the sovereignty of God sometimes. We need a balanced perspective. Both Calvinists and Arminians can suffer from uncertainty about their salvation. A Calvinist may accept Jesus Christ, but wonder if he's elect. There have been famous instances of 
Calvinists who went to their deathbed, not sure if they were elect, and consequently, they were not sure if their faith was genuine. Well, what a foolish, foolish, foolish fear to have. The Arminian, of course, is not sure if his faith will endure, sadly, uh, and that also has its problems. We talked about that earlier in chapter one. I like here what a former professor of mine uh, actually, no, that is not a former professor of mine. I was thinking of someone else. But I like here what John Jefferson Davis says, another scholar, a secret pretemporal degree and limited atonement can give rise to nagging doubts and unhealthy introspection or, un, or doubt as the believer wonders, am I really one of the elect for whom Christ died? Yet in a real sense, John 3.16 is the only decree with which the believer needs to be concerned. Assurance of election comes as the believer responds in faith to Christ offered in the preaching of the gospel. I, I love this statement. If anybody asks you, how do you know if you're elect? The answer is John 3.16. <laughs> that is where we build our hope and faith on. I never have to fear about whether or not I am elect because I am joined to Jesus Christ by faith. Jesus Christ is the elect one. When I am joined to Jesus Christ, I am elect, and Jesus says, him that cometh to the Father, I will in no wise cast out. And I trust his statement that he will not cast me out then. But the sad, the sad reality is that many believe that the doctrine of election is a doctrine of anxiety, and it should not be. Now, going back to verse 8 real quick. There is an interesting phrase there, whereunto also they were appointed. Some Calvinists might take this to refer to mean that God has appointed people to destruction and that there was no choice involved, but that is not the case. I like what John Eliot says here. This Petrine formulation is no reference to divine predestination of non-believers to condemnation. That which is set or established by God is the stumbling resulting from not heeding the word rather than the disobedience itself. It is the result of disobedience that is foreordained, not the decision itself. In other words, God does not elect unbelievers to destruction uh, to uh, to disobedience. God does not determine that people will not believe. But if those people will not believe, then God determines that those who do not believe will be destined for destruction, stumbling. In other words, it once again centers on Jesus Christ. If we accept Jesus Christ as Savior. God chooses us to eternal life. If we reject Jesus Christ, then God chooses such a person for destruction. But it is all based on Jesus Christ. And this is what the Calvinist forgets. The doctrine of election is based on Jesus Christ. And I believe this passage teaches us that. A person's election is based on that person's response to Jesus Christ, who is, in fact, uh, the elect one. All right, a couple more points, and then we will have a break. Uh, verses 9 through 10. Does the, So here in verses 9 through 10, the Apostle Peter uses language that is originally meant for Israel and applies that to us, uh, the church. Now, it is worth asking whether or not perhaps the epistle of Peter was written to Jewish Christians more than Gentile Christians. And I think slowly I am coming to that position in my own study of Scripture, uh, that perhaps this is meant for Jewish Christians first, even though obviously it most definitely has application to us. However, even if it does, even if the initial audience was Gentile Christians, it still does not mean that God has replaced Israel. I like what Hebert says here, who is well worth reading, who would be a good source to use in your Bible studies it does not naturally follow from the parallel between Israel and the church that Peter believed that the church has permanently replaced Israel and that the latter will not again enjoy a separate existence under the favor of God. Israel's future is inseparably connected with its acceptance by faith of the returning Messiah. And we see that in Romans 11, 25 through 27. And I want, I wish for you to turn there very quickly. We will return to 1 Peter soon. Romans 11, 25 through 27, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. In other words, there is a limit on the blindness. Right now, Israel, the people of Israel, Jews, have been blinded. There are a few that are born again. 
but a small, small minority, I think less than 1%. They have been blinded for a while until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Well, we are the Gentiles, you and I, Americans and Indians and Japanese and Africans, we are the Gentiles. When the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, then the blindness will be lifted from Israel. There will be a great revival. Verse 26, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. This is still future. Even though there are some Jews that are born again today, in the future, God will rescue the entire nation of Israel. I like here what... Cranfield says in his commentary on Romans, we shall misunderstand Romans 9 through 11 if we fail to recognize that their key word is mercy. It is only where the church persists in refusing to learn this message where it secretly, perhaps quite unconsciously, believes that its own existence is based on human achievement and so fails to understand God's mercy to itself that it is unable to believe that God's mercy for unbelieving Israel in God's mercy for unbelieving Israel, and so entertains the ugly and unscriptural notion that God has cast off his people Israel and simply replaced it by the Christian church. We have not replaced Israel. The church has not replaced Israel. How do we know that? Because God does not forget his promises, because it is not about our merit. It is not about our own works righteousness. It is about the grace and mercy of God. Has Israel earned God's grace? No, she has not. Israel has not earned God's, earned God's grace. Well, then why should she be saved? Because it is the mercy that God will extend to Israel through Jesus Christ. Nobody is saved by their own righteousness. Nobody is saved by their own merit. It is only through Jesus Christ and the mercy of God. That is why I can confidently assert God will redeem Israel because he promised to. Because it is not about Israel's performance. It is about the mercy of God. God will put in their hearts a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone, as Jeremiah says, the new covenant in Jeremiah. That is still future, but God will accomplish accomplish that. And I believe after the rapture has taken away the Gentile church, that it will be Israel's turn during the tribulation, during the rise of the Antichrist, it will be Israel's turn to reach the nations uh, with, with the gospel. But once again, the key point here, and this is a little bit, a little bit beyond our, our passage, but the key point here is that God will, will rescue Israel. Even though she has sinned, even though she has been blinded, God will rescue Israel because our God is a gracious, loving God. So even though some of the language applied to Israel is applied to the church, we are grafted in, we are like an olive branch grafted into the tree. Nonetheless, God still has a future for Israel, and the proof of that is Romans 11. A couple things real quick, uh, going back uh, notice royal priesthood verses five and nine. We talked about that as born again members of a local church and as individual members of the family of God, you function as a priesthood. What only Levites could do in the past, you perform now regardless of your race or social status. We should thank God that we have access to him through Jesus Christ. Nobody else stands in the way. Unlike the Roman Catholics, unlike even uh, certain forms of Anglicanism and, and so forth that have priests, nobody else stands between me and God. Jesus Christ is the mediator. As priests before God, we proclaim his glorious virtues and his appointment of Jesus Christ as Savior of the world. And you can declare this to all the nations of the world. Notice what it says then in verse uh, nine, we are a, uh, that you should show forth the praises. That word show forth, exangaleto in Greek, this means proclaim. This is vocal proclamation. This is gospel witness. The purpose of our priesthood, the purpose of our being part of this new spiritual temple is the vocal proclamation of the glories of God. In other words, the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. And then verse 10 both in reference to Israel, but also in reference to us Gentiles now. Once upon a time, we were separate from the people of God, but now we are a people. Once upon a time, we were without mercy. Before our encounter with the living stone, Jesus Christ, we were without mercy, but now 
we are a people to whom mercy has been shown. And an excellent passage for that, for further, further study on this theological theme, is Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, let's see. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Whereon to remember that ye being in the past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made with hands, that at that time you're without Christ being aliens. Notice that term there, similar terminology to First Peter, from the commonwealth of Israel, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. In other words, brought near. In the first century, when the apostle Paul was writing this epistle, there was an actual wall around the temple, a certain point beyond which Gentiles could not pass. And there was a sign on the wall, an inscription on the wall saying Gentile, and that would be you and I, <laughs> non-Jews. Gentile, if you pass this point, you, will, uh, you are responsible for your own death. The idea being that you would be killed if you pass this point. In other words, there was a literal and spiritual wall of separation between Jews and Gentiles. Christ has demolished that wall so that we as Gentiles, Indians and Americans and Japanese and Africans and Germans, we as Gentiles, together with the Jews, can be called the people of God. And that is what Jesus Christ has accomplished through his atonement, bringing in all the nations of the world. When we get to the end of Revelation, uh, this is also one of my favorite passages Romans, uh, excuse me, Revelation 22, verse 2, describing the new Jerusalem, and in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the tree, was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, plural, not just nations, singular, not just one nation, not just Israel, but nations, plural. Jesus Christ will redeem a people for himself out of every nation, tribe, and tongue, but he will also heal the nations, plural. And that is a very, very important point to understand. Okay, I think that is the uh, end of this section. So this would be a good place to uh, take a break. Are there, are there any questions before we take a break? Okay, remember those two key points, that election is based on Jesus Christ, and that Jesus Christ is creating us, causing all of us to be a spiritual house to show forth his praises. So, okay, five minute break. Uh, I don't know what time that would be in India, but five minutes and I shall see you all momentarily. Okay, I am excellent, excellent. Okay, I lost track of time a little bit, but I think we are ready to go. We are now, we will now start 1 Peter 2, verse 11. Uh, let's see, whoops. Okay, share screen. Okay. There we go. Okay, this will be a very, very important passage for understanding, for understanding the Christian's responsibility to the government. A few months ago in May, I preached a sermon with, uh, uh, to our students in college for summer school, and I challenged them to be praying for their government. That is certainly one duty uh, one duty that every Christian should have. Uh, for my part, I pray every morning for the U.S. president and for the vice president and for the governor, even though I do not like any of them <laughs> and I did not vote for any of them. And I think all three of them are, uh, can be dangerous and have some bad ideas. Nonetheless, the Apostle Paul commanded that prayer and intercession be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority. And so that is the challenge then, the proper understanding of, a, of government authority and the proper relationship of the Christian to that authority 
is what we will focus on somewhat in this passage, keeping in mind the Roman background of 1 Peter. So look at 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12. 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having our conversation, that means conduct, anastrophe, lifestyle, among the gen honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So we start there, and then we will discuss the government. The word beloved here indicates a new division in the epistle. In this passage, Peter has established Jesus Christ as the foundation for the church and for our life. From there, he will focus on the Christian's relationship to the world around him. In other words, he has gone from discussing theology to now discussing practice, from doctrine to lifestyle. How then should we live? We can live in such a way that the world will be forced to stop slandering us, that we can live in such a way that the world will notice our good works and eventually glorify God. Who we are in Jesus Christ will determine how we live. So we start with that word beloved. I beseech you, or I urge you, or I exhort you. Uh, some translations have I beg. I don't, I don't like that translation. That's too weak. This is a strong word, exhortation. Uh, notice the repetition of that term stranger. So that term uh, strangers and pilgrims, it is paroikos kai parapodemos. One of those words has already occurred in 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Parapodemos, to the elect strangers, i.e. resident aliens. A similar word, parochia, occurs in 1 Peter 1, verse 17, past the time of your sojourning, parochia. Peter has just made it clear that we are part of a holy nation. The church is that holy nation. We are bound together not by, uh, not by the blood in our bodies and our DNA and our genealogy or our citizenship, but we are bound together by the blood of Jesus Christ into a holy nation. And yet we are still strangers on earth. In other words, you and I have more common. We are more brothers than an unbeliever who, is, who has the same citizenship or a neighbor or even perhaps a blood relation. Uh, so that nationality is not important when we focus on the church, that we are together as brothers and sisters in Christ in the church and strangers to those around us. And once again, some of us may have experienced being a foreigner in another place where people speak a different language uh, but all Christians are strangers to the world around them precisely because we serve and worship only Jesus Christ. We serve one God uh, and we set aside the idols and so forth. We are called to do battle against fleshly desires through the power of the Spirit. Notice because we are united in Jesus Christ, verse, uh, verse 11, we are to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. So flee from those desires. Anything that would cause us to stumble. Jesus Christ said, if, you're, if your hand offend you, cut it off. If your eye offend you, pluck it out. He is using, using shock language, harsh terminology there to make the point, whatever it is that will cause you to stumble, get rid of it or take, uh, uh, take precautions against it. Romans 12, uh, 1 through 2 is a key passage here that, that says much the same thing as Peter. In Romans 12, 1 through 2, the Apostle Paul says this, if I can find it in my Bible. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. In other words, do not be made into the image of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Since we have the Holy Spirit in us, 
we are being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. It is a process. Being born again is a one-time event, but sanctification is a process. We are being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And part of that process is to flee from lusts or desires, from fleshly desires that war against the soul. Whatever would come between us and Jesus Christ, let us flee from that. Notice then, Peter focuses on our testimony in the eyes of, belie of unbelievers. The emphasis is on having a good or honorable life, having your conversation that is conduct, anastrophe, uh, that means lifestyle, honest. That word honest there is kalos. It can actually mean beautiful. And it's interesting because Peter assumes that unbelievers will speak evil against us, whereas they speak against you as evildoers, that unbelievers will slander us. And even, even in America right now, Christians who oppose homosexuality and Christians who oppose the killing of babies and abortion, they are spoken evil against. And in India, Christians who oppose, who go against uh, idolatry, who go against Islam, who go against corruption, they will be spoken evil against. Peter assumes that. Peter knows that that is a reality. And yet, look what he says. He says we should still have our conduct, our lifestyle, kalos, good or beautiful in the eyes of unbelievers. Why? That they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation that they shall buy your good works, which they shall behold. The good works of Christians do not save, but they can help evangelize others. Notice, glorify God in the day of visitation. This is, uh, this is uh, somewhat debated, but it does seem to refer to the second coming of Jesus Christ when Jesus Christ will judge the world. Yeah, you, Wayne Grudem in your textbook, I believe, is correct. I don't always agree with your textbook, but usually I do. And, and here I believe Wayne Grudem is correct when he says that this implies the, the voluntary praise of people who have been converted. Now, we must understand every knee will bow before Jesus Christ. Uh, Philippians 2 is very clear about that. Every knee shall bow, that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That includes both Christians and unbelievers. Things in heaven, that of course is angels. Things on earth, that is all people, both believers and unbelievers. Things under the earth in Philippians 2. That word is katakthonion, and that actually refers to evil spirits, to demons. Even demons will be forced to fall before Jesus Christ. So we understand every knee will bow. However, I want you to look closely at this verse. Every knee will bow regardless. But Peter says that we are to do good works, which they shall behold, and that they will be glorified, that they may by your good works glorify God in the day of visitation. In other words, there is something here different from the fact that every knee will bow, including unbelievers. To glorify God in the day of visitation, because it occurs as a result of our beautiful life, our honorable life, our honest life among the Gentiles, because it occurs as a result of that, this is not merely talking about how every knee will bow. This, I believe, is something different. This refers to conversion. Why would an unbeliever glorify God in the day of visitation? Precisely because they have seen your good works. They have realized that the evil, that the evil spoken of of Christians is not true. They will start to investigate who is this Jesus of whom you speak, and they will accept him as Savior. That's how people glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, in light of that, an extremely important point to emphasize is that both vocal proclamation, gospel witness and preaching, and good works are essential. Both of those are important. Sometimes people uh, play one against the other. In America for a while, this was a big debate among, among Baptists, uh, similar to us. Some, some saying that, uh, some would say that, that uh, souls are won only through 
uh, vocal evangelism. Others are saying that souls are won through quote unquote lifestyle evangelism uh, in which they minimize vocal proclamation, but both perspectives are not entirely correct. Of course, one must preach the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15. Nobody is saved without the gospel, and that is primary. However, good works play a supporting role, Peter teaches us. They may, by your good works, realize that the slander is incorrect. When you live a good life that seeks to glorify God, that separates from the world, that does not get drunk, that does not do drugs, that does not commit immorality, when you live a separate life that glorifies God, and when you help others, people will notice that. They may try to slander you at first, <laughs> but they will realize, they will become embarrassed when they realize that their slander is so obviously false. Look at these passages in 1 Peter that emphasize both vocal proclamation, witness and preaching, and good works. So notice preaching and, and witness and vocal witness, uh, chapter 2, verse 9. We already saw this. I'm sorry, that says 1, 9. That should actually be 2, 9. Chapter 2, verse 9, uh, that you should show forth the praises. That word show forth in the Greek is exangaleo. Uh, it means vocal proclamation, that you should audibly proclaim the praises. So that is vocal witness. Notice chapter 3, verse 1, uh, talking to wives. We will talk about this next week. Wives, that if any obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by the conversation. That means conduct of the wives. But the assumption is they obey not the word. Why? Because the wife has already been giving them the word. The wife has already been sharing with them with them scripture. That is assumed here in this verse. Even though they initially reject that, the wife has already been witnessing to them. And notice 315, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer. And that is not through good works at this point. That is through conversation to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So these three passages in 1 Peter clearly refer to vocal proclamation, to witness, to preaching. We are to be preaching and witnesses, that witness thing, that is extremely important. However, in a supporting role, we see good works. 2.12, we just read that, that they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Good works cause people to realize that their slander is wrong, and it will cause them to listen more closely to you when you give them the gospel. In other words, nobody is going to listen to a Christian who's a drunkard or who has been drinking alcohol, who is not different from the world. Nobody is going to listen to a Christian who makes crude, inappropriate, uh, immoral jokes. Nobody is going to uh, listen to a Christian who, who does not treat their family right, who does not love uh, their family correctly. So good works then help people realize that there is something genuine to this faith. Notice 2.15, for so is the will of God that with well-doing, that with doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, people that would slander you. Notice then 3.1, that they may also, without the word, husbands can be without the word, won by the conversation, the conduct, the lifestyle of their wives. And then 3.14 through 15, uh, oops, that was, I already looked at that. Uh, 3.14, uh, happy uh, if you suffer for righteousness's sake. Uh, verse 16, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation. That is anastrophe, anastrophe, conduct or lifestyle. So both gospel witness, both personal witness and good works play a role. Now, personal witness is primary. People cannot get saved unless we share with them the gospel. That is understood. In other words, you may live a excellent life, a whole holy life, but if you never if you never witness to people, if you never share the gospel, then what good does that do? So the gospel witness is primary. We must be ready to give a witness and testimony at any time to anybody that asks, to any opportunities that God gives us. However, if we are attempting to share the gospel 
but our lifestyle does not reflect the holiness and goodness and love of God, then people will consider us a hypocrite. And so that is where good works also uh, plays a role. Both are important there. Uh, let's see, some, now some have suggested, going back a little bit, some have suggested that the good works in view here are Christians uh, making public, uh, public donations to the city. So for example, building a, uh, building a, oh, a public forum, donating money for the sake of the city, helping repair a bridge. Uh, some have suggested that that is the case. However, that assumes that Christians were, <laughs> that, that assumes rich Christians and rich Christians in the first century and in most of the world are very, very rare. And there is simply no way that Peter could have expected most Christians to be involved in that sort of a thing. But having said that, Peter intends the good works of Christians to be obvious, to be publicly visible. So when people look at the life of a Christian that they are trying to slam it should be obvious that these Christians are good people that love others. There are certain things a Christian can never do. A Christian will never worship idols. A Christian should never participate in an idolatrous festival. Uh, Jesus made that clear. Both Paul and Jesus made that clear. And the apostles in Acts, uh, meat offered to idols refers to an idolatrous banquet. An idolatrous banquet. So Christians in Japan must make the choice to not participate in certain festivals. Uh, Japan mixes Buddhism and Shintoism, and there are many festivals which can be a fun time for Japanese, but that nonetheless are mixed with idolatry. For example, the Obon festival. Obon in Japanese, uh, bon in Japanese means platter. The Obon festival is where Japanese people take out platters with offerings on them to try to appease the souls of the deck. And, uh, and they also sent out, put lanterns, lighted lanterns, and float them on the, on the water and so forth. And it is a very pagan festival. And Christians cannot participate in that anymore. Uh, it is funny, though. <laughs> uh, Buddhism is very inconsistent in Japan. Uh, a little bit of a side story. My father knew of a lady that became a Christian because she actually loved her husband. And when her husband died, she wanted to ensure that her husband went went to heaven and Buddhism in Japan, I don't know about Buddhism in India, but Buddhism in Japan, they, uh, they have you purchase a name, a new heavenly name for the dead. And the more you, money you pay for that name, <laughs> the better position the, the dead, the more the dead will enjoy the afterlife, which if, uh, if that is not a scam, a swindle, then I don't know what is <laughs> enriching the Buddhist priest through uh, the death of loved ones. But nonetheless, this lady loved her husband and wished to, uh, wished to purchase a good name for him so that he would enjoy the afterlife. And she did so. And the Buddhist priest ensured her that her husband was enjoying the afterlife. But then the Obon festival came around. And so the next time she met with the Buddhist priest, he reminded her to participate in the Obon festival. And here's what she, had, she should do in the Obon festival to appease the spirits of the dead that are suffering in hell. <laughs> and at that point, the lady realized, wait a minute, I have spent all this money on my husband to ensure that he has a good place in the afterlife. And now you are saying that he is suffering in hell? <laughs> and at that point, the lady recognized the hypocrisy and the wrongness of Buddhism and eventually converted to Christianity. So anyway, so I make the point to say that there are certain things that a Christian cannot participate in uh, within society. However, there may be opportunities for a Christian to help out their community that do not involve idolatry. And a Christian should be open to those opportunities, perhaps for example, if there is flooding, perhaps helping people uh, with the flooding, helping repair bridges, helping rescue people, that sort of a thing, uh, helping in the hospital, volunteering in the hospital. Uh, there are certain ways in which a Christian may help out in society without compromising, okay, nothing that involves idolatry, but that can help out in society and thus be a blessing to people. And when people learn that they are Christians, then this may be an opportunity to glorify God by giving the gospel. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, encourage then your believers to help others in society to be a 
helpful part of society, of their neighborhood, of their town, of their village, but without compromising the gospel, without idolatry, of course. That then leads us to verses 13 through 17, the Christian's responsibility to the government. And this, of course, is a more difficult topic in India, where so often the government is very hostile to Christians. America has been protected to a certain degree, although I believe that protection is slowly eroding away. Uh, certainly some governments are more hostile, some local governments are more hostile to Christians, but there are enough Christians, whether true Christians or fake Christians, there are enough Christians in America that politicians are very hesitant to attack Christianity directly. Even the current president of the United States, Joe Biden, who is very liberal, uh, who supports uh, the abomination that is homosexual marriage, who supports the abomination that is abortion, the killing of babies, even Joe Biden, who I believe is a bad president, though I pray for him, even President Joe Biden still considers himself a Roman Catholic and thus a Christian. So uh, nonetheless, it is clear that Christians are always to submit to God first. Uh, Acts 15, 20, 529, the Apostle Peter, when he is urged to stop preaching the gospel, the Apostle Peter says, we ought to obey God rather than man. So we understand that. Uh, nonetheless, Peter is writing during the reign of Nero. Remember, we learned at the beginning of this class, Nero is the one who will have Peter and Paul and a lot of Christians executed. By now, you should have clicked down that link and read Tacitus. Tacitus describes what happened to Christians during the reign of Nero. They were executed in horrible manners. And I, I know India, I, I have heard of cases of Christians being burned alive in India, surrounded by, by Hindus and, and, and having their car set on fire. I've heard of cases like that. So I think uh, you in India understand the reality of what can happen to Christians perhaps more than us in America, uh, where the worst thing that can happen sometimes is that we have a door slammed in our face or people get angry at us for sharing the gospel. But in India, of course, the danger is much, much more real. And P First Peter then is not writing this epistle in America. He is writing this epistle uh, probably from Rome, the very place that he will be executed by Nero. Nero is is not a good ruler. Nero was corrupt. He was depraved. His morals, uh, his morals were horrible. Nero was a wicked, wicked, wicked man. And yet, in spite of that, Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, urges submission as much as possible. Once again, the ultimate authority for Christians is Jesus Christ. We have one king, and that is Jesus Christ. And if there is a okay, good, good. Recording is in progress. Excellent. Okay, there we go. Uh, let's see. Okay, so so Peter is saying. Did I share screen? I think, I, yes. Okay. Peter is saying that Peter, of course, has said we ought to obey God rather than man. Christians submit to God first. If there is a conflict between God and earthly authority, we must follow God. Now, the problem with American Christians, <laughs> and I speak as an American Christian who grew up in Japan, the problem with American Christians is every time a law is passed that they, don't, that they don't like, sometimes they assume that that means that it is a conflict with God's law. So for, Amer for example, American Christians, uh, many American Christians are obsessed with guns and they wish to own guns and they wish to shoot guns. And I have no problem. I do not own a gun. I own a very nice sword, a Chinese sword, but I don't own a gun. <laughs> uh, and I have no plans to. I I am all in favor of owning a gun for the sake of hunting, and in some extreme cases, perhaps for protecting one's family, but even then I, I would hesitate to recommend it. But some Americans, unfortunately, assume that somehow owning guns is an unalienable right, and if the government wishes to take away their guns, that they are opposing God. And that, and that is a wrong attitude. <laughs> 
the Bible never tells Christians to own guns, of course. So that is just an example of how some Christians misunderstand this command. They assume that any, any commandment, any law that is passed that they don't like, that they can ignore because they are Christians first and foremost, and that is the wrong attitude. On the other hand, there are sometimes laws that are passed that would oppose the commandment of God. And we understand that. And every Christian must meet, must prayerfully consider that. So, for example, a command to worship idols, that would be contrary to the law of God, and a Christian would have to oppose that. Uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, first, also taking care of one's family. If you provide not for your family, uh, Paul says you are worse than an infidel. So a Christian has the obligation to take care of their family to the best of their ability, uh, and so forth. Now, in matters, though, where there is no clear conflict with Scripture, and the key here is Scripture, a Christian should follow the government, not because we are citizens, though we probably are, but because we are strangers representing God's kingdom on earth with the opportunity to win people for Christ. In other words, Peter is not telling me, Brother Paul, obey the government because you are an American citizen. He is not telling you, obey the government because you are a citizen of India or, or wherever. Rather, he is telling all of us, obey the government because you are a citizen of heaven who needs to have a good testimony. That is the point in this passage. We are strangers on earth representing God's kingdom to the world, and we must not allow people the opportunity to slander us. We must not allow people the opportunity to accuse us of of uh, rebellion or anything along those lines. Now, this is very, very interesting. So please focus on First Peter, First uh, Peter chapter two, verse thirteen. Submit yourselves. Now, that phrase, "every ordinance of man." With all due respect, I am going to differ a little bit from the King James James translation. I like the King James translation. It is the best translation in the English language, though obviously not for other languages, but it was, it was published 400 years ago, and the final authority is what the Greek says. And so I am going to respectfully and carefully uh, differ from the King James translation there, uh, specifically the word ordinance. The Greek phrase is passe anthropone katisse. This means to ever, now the word katisse there here means every created human being. Katisse in the Bible always refers to God's creation, not man's. The word katisse can refer to, for example, all of creation. It can re refer to specific parts of creation. And often it refers to human beings. So for example, the Great Commission in Mark 16, 15. Turning your Bibles real quick to Mark 16, 15. Here is an example of the word referring to human beings. Mark 16, 15. Here Jesus used a word that Mark translates, or perhaps Jesus was speaking Greek, or perhaps he was speaking Aramaic or Hebrew and Mark translated, but the point being, the Holy Spirit inspired this word, preach the gospel to every katissos there. Same word that First Peter uses, same word that the apostle Peter uses. Now, does this refer to animals? Well, no, of course not. Animals can't understand the gospel. It refers to human beings. Same word that occurs in First Peter 2, Verse 13, submit yourself to every human katisse. And the context indicates those that are in authority. Submit yourself to every human being in authority. This is not referring to laws per se, but rather to the people that pass those laws. Obviously, we should obey the laws when we can, but this is referring to people. Now, here is a very, very, very key point. Remember that. The Roman emperor was considered deity. The Roman emperor was considered a god. Peter here makes an extremely important point to believers. When you obey the Roman emperor, you do not obey him as a god, but as a man. Let me make that point uh, again because it is extremely important. When you obey a human ruler, 
You do not obey him as a God, no matter what that ruler might claim for himself. You do not obey him as a God, but as a human being. All rulers are set under the authority of God. It is God who puts them in position. No ruler has the right to claim deity. That's why that Christians must not worship the emperor in, in Rome. Christians can obey the emperor to the extent that they are able, but not if it involves the worship of the emperor. Remember, uh, the letters, uh, you should have read, the, the links are in the syllabus. The emperor Trajan corresponding with the governor Pliny a few decades after 1 Peter was written. And Pliny says, what should I do with these Christians? Here's what I did. I forced them to recant if they were willing to curse Christ and worship your image. And he's speaking to the emperor here. If they were willing to curse Christ and worship their image, I let them go free because it was obvious that they were not a Christian. So that is key. Christians may respect and honor and pray and pray for, not pray to, pray for the emperor and obey the emperor so long as they are able to, but not as a god but rather as a human being. In other words, with that one phrase, passe anthropene catisse, with that one phrase, Peter simultaneously urges submission to the emperor, but only on God's terms, not the emperor's terms. We, when we obey our ruling authorities, they may claim whatever they wish. They may claim divine power. They may claim divine authority, whatever. Whatever they may wish to claim, that's fine. But we can only obey them to the extent that God allows us to, not on the basis of their own claims. This makes an incredible difference. I like here, I like here the quote by John Eliot. Uh, let's see. Whoops. There we go. In contrast, to the devotees of the imperial cult who rendered obeisance to the emperor as lord and god christians respect the emperor and his representatives only as human creatures do only the deference owed to all human beings uh stressed again in verse 17 ultimate supremacy is reserved for god the creator in other words yes we must obey governing authorities but only in a position below god so when a conflict occurs between God's command and their command, then we must say we must obey God rather than men. But we still nonetheless, because God has put them in that position, then we must obey them. Now, this is an extremely important perspective to have. Remember Daniel chapter 3 and Daniel chapter 11. What or, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 6. What happens in Daniel chapter 3? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego ago had positions of authority in a government in a corrupt government in an immoral government but god had placed them in positions of authority when king nebuchadnezzar in his arrogance demanded that they worship his image they refused but notice they refused respectfully <laughs> they still they did not insult the king they did not insult their authority they refused respectfully but they still had to obey god rather than man in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel had a good relationship with King Darius, and, and yet Daniel could not obey the command to pray. He needed to pray, and Daniel also was in a position of authority uh, in the government. He obeyed, his, he obeyed his king in many other things, but not when it came to the command to not pray. He needed to pray, and he did not hide that fact. So keep that in mind. Daniel 3 and 6 are very, very good paradigms. Uh, then. In other words, we Christians will willingly obey our authorities, whether that be the emperor, the king, the prime minister, the president, the local governor, the mayor, the police officer, but we obey them as humans and only to the extent that they do not intrude upon God's domain and God's laws. This prohibits Christians from worshiping idols or the emperor because that is God's domain. Yet on the other hand, in regard to paying taxes, God has allowed this to be the emperor's domain. So Romans 13 is also a key passage here. And remember, the apostle Paul is also speaking of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was not a good empire. The Roman Empire could be very brutal. The Roman Empire could be very unfair. And yet even in regards to the Roman Empire... 
and so also America, and so also the government of India, and so also Japan. Peter said, uh, Paul says, let every soul all be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Generally speaking, rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Um, but for he is the minister of God to thee for good. Uh, verse five, wherefore you must need to be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause pay you tribute, i.e. taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And remember, Jesus Christ even supernaturally provided for payment of a tax when Peter asked him once uh, with a coin in the mouth of a fish. So God is able to help us uh, pay taxes even when those taxes might be unfair. I have a friend who is a, uh, who is a missionary to South America and right now, the churches in this particular country in South America are going through a difficult time because the government has decreed a, a very foolish decree that any, any building that does not look like a church must pay taxes. Normally, churches would be exempt from taxes, uh, uh, but any church that does not look like a church must pay taxes. And that, of course, is a very stupid law. Who gets to determine what looks like a church, what looks like a church building? And yet, my friend and, and the churches are trying to figure out then how can they respectfully pay taxes without disobeying. They are doing their best then to try to obey. Now, they, of course, it is not a sin to consult with the lawyer. It is not a sin to seek the law and see what the law says. Certainly, those are, those are appropriate, but one must try as much as possible to obey uh, Notice in verse 15, oh, 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 one more thing, going back to Japan, uh, this became an extremely important point in Japan, not worshiping the emperor. Uh, during World War II in Japan, uh, Shinto was Japan's state religion. Uh, Japan mixes Buddhism and Shintoism. A Japanese pastor once told my father that the true religion of Japan is the worship of the ancestors, because everybody does that uh, quite often. But Japan mixed Buddhism and Shintoism, but the official state religion of Japan was Shintoism. Now, Buddhism at least is, can be fairly sophisticated with written texts and the teachings of Buddha and so forth. Obviously, there's a lot of foolishness still there. Uh, but Shintoism is much more primitive. Shintoism is simply the worship of, of dead people, the worship of, uh, of various spirits. It is a very animistic, primitive religion. Uh, compared to even Buddhism. But Shintoism was a state religion. Under Shintoism, the emperor of Japan was called a god. In fact, the emperor of Japan was called, the phrase I used to describe him was ten no heka. Ten is heaven and heka is emissary. So the emperor of Japan was called the emissary of heaven. And he was worshipped as a god, even though in fact he had little political power compared to his generals and prime minister and so forth. So Japanese Christians then were forced to make a decision to what, what, to what degree can I respect the emperor? To what degree, uh, how should I treat the emperor? Because it's necessary for a Christian in Japan to respect the emperor, but they must, and, and as a important human being and as the ruler of their nation, but not as a god. And refusal to re worship the emperor as a god, to treat him as supernatural, resulted in persecution of Japanese Christians. And many, many praises to those Japanese Christians who were strong in refusing to worship the emperor, even while they respected him, but refusing to worship him. And, and that is and that is a key point to understand. Uh, we will talk more about the relation of the relationship of the Christian uh, to the government later on. We will focus on verse 15. But I will mention that, uh, and I think this is more relevant in India, although in America also it is relevant, it is important for unbelievers to realize that Christians are submissive to the government and that they are not trying to cause a rebellion. Christians must not get mixed up with anything that would seem to hint that they are causing a rebellion. Now, I, I will give us an ex example, an American example. So recently, of course, we had the election of President Biden instead of President Trump. 
And a lot of conservative, and even though I, I do not like President Trump as much, I do not believe he was a true Christian. I Nonetheless, he made good choices compared to President Biden. However, when President Biden won the election, there were a lot of Americans, more conservatives, that went to Washington, D.C. and stormed the Capitol. And uh, some people call it an insurrection. It wasn't quite that, but they went into the Capitol and they made a mess and they rioted. And that even though I believe that President Trump was a better president than President Joe Biden so far, nonetheless, that is the sort of thing that a Christian must never participate in. A Christian must not participate in that sort of thing. That harms the testimony of Jesus Christ. So Christians must live in such a way that it is very clear they are not here to cause trouble for the government. They are not here to cause rebellion or anything like that. They must be model citizens to the best of their ability. And once again, Christians must not compromise. They must not worship idols. This will cause problems in Rome because Christians in Rome could not worship the emperor. They could not worship idols. That will cause persecution. So persecution will come. But in the midst of all that, Christians must try to make it clear through their lifestyle that they are model citizens, that they are not wishing to cause trouble uh, for the government. And we will talk more about that next week in a very important passage. Uh, but for now, I think we will stop here and we have a few minutes. Let me stop this screen share. Okay. Um, I would, I would especially, uh, obviously, if you have any questions of me, that is fine. But if any of you, I think some of you are in a better position to lecture on this topic than I. <laughs> and I would be interested if any of you who have been in pastoral ministry have some insights, perhaps for the younger, younger people here, I would be interested in hearing from you for a couple minutes. Does, does anybody have anything to add? Some of you, I think, are better are, uh, would be better on this topic than I, uh, lecturing on this topic, speaking on this topic. Does anybody have anything to add on this? Well, put some thought into this. I, I think, the, uh, those of you in India are in a better position than I am to perhaps understand the difficulties of life uh, with a difficult government, perhaps sometimes, uh, and just the difficulties of living the Christian life without compromise, but in a way uh, that nonetheless makes it clear to people around you that, that uh, you are harmless, I think is the key word. Christians need to be understood as harmless People need to look at Christians and, and see we are harmless. We wish no harm to anybody. We are model citizens, even though Jesus Christ is the supreme authority in our lives. So uh, even maybe next week at the beginning of class, if, if uh, someone has something to share on that, I can learn a lot from you on this topic. <laughs> As an American Christian, I have too easy a life. I understand that. I acknowledge that. Uh, and, and some of you all have had to suffer for the cause of Christ, and I, I respect that. Uh, you will receive greater reward than I, I believe, in the kingdom of heaven. And uh, so, okay, well, let us pray for each other over the next week. And I am praying for you all. And thank you all for your attention. And uh, tomorrow, as I mentioned, I, I made a note tomorrow, I will make a document and send it to you all with all the sources, full information on the sources that I've been using, and internet links as well when they are available. So, yes. Yes, sir. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Have a blessed day. Right, right. Thank you. And the document which you have sent, mm -hmm. some, of, some of them are not receiving through the email, but okay. I can pass over to them. Okay. I will appreciate that. If, yeah, yes, yeah. if any, thank I you, can you can pass, pass over. Them. Yeah, right, right. I can pass one after another, those who are not receiving. I will take okay. care for that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Have a blessed day. Have a nice day to you. <laughs> uh, sir, I, thank uh, you. Sir, Victor, sir. Yes. Oh, I have, I have some uh, uh, doubts. I just wanted to clarify.